I start, I just want to say that rather than people having to frantically take photos of slides on their phone or write things down, um, these slides are available on the internet. Um, and there's a QR code for the convenience of typing in the URLs to the um, because it's, I find it really annoying when someone's like, look, that slideshow links, and I'm like, that's great, I'm watching you, I'm not sitting at a computer where it's useful to those things. So there you go. Um, so a little bit more about me. Uh, so I am one of the people on the team uh, at Data61, at CSIRO, uh, that develops Perio.js, uh, which is and I'm directly copy pasting to that website because someone better at writing wrote this. Um, an open source framework for web-based geospatial intelligence tools. <laughs> um, so basically it's a web mapping platform. Um, mostly we work with state governments, um, but we do quite a lot of work with Geoparks Australia um, as well. So um, Alex mentioned Digital Earth Africa um, and Digital Earth Australia. Um, we take the wonderful data from Geoscience Australia and the data team um, and give it a home, a visualization home, because it's many homes. Um, and we also produce, uh, along with um, the relevant state governments, the New South Wales and Queensland digital twins. So this screenshot here um, is from the New South Wales digital twin. Um, and so Terraria.js sits on top of Cesium.js. Um, so Cesium is a basically a virtual globe platform. Um, so Terraria kind of does the, the catalog stuff on top of that, um, sort of a, we like to think user-friendly UI, um, and some extra format support um, on top of Cesium. And like the, the thing that Cesium really shines for, I think, is 3D data. Um, one thing, it's a globe. Um, so you don't get the same distortion you get from projections, which if you're already doing things in 3D, um, why not make your own 3D as well? Um, and it's really flexible, um, like lots of people build platforms with Cesium, Terrier is just one of them. Um, so I would highly recommend it if you want to show 3D data, particularly if you want to drape stuff on grain, um, or you know you need to yeah just put 3D things on top of terrain rather than on like a flat ellipsoid or something because um, it does a really good job uh, and this is all browser based as well uh, which is very cool um <laughs> so you can see on the right there um that was one of my early attempts at uh rendering a bin building information model i believe it's one of the buildings at the university of queensland um and it looks more like the death star uh 3d is hard 3d is more than half as hard compared to 2D. Um, the maths is way harder. I'm not a mathematician, but I had to learn a whole bunch of pretty maths. Um, and one of the big problems is that major open source tools, mostly, not entirely, um, but are basically focused on 2D. Because most data is 2D, and if you're an open source person, you want to focus on the things that most people use. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, but it means you know our staples, like QGIS, um, which is wonderful, um, has some 3D support, right? But um, not for sort of super complicated 3D rendering and analysis and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I think kind of the lack of, you know, there are tools that support this stuff, but a lack of mainstream support for 3D kind of is linked to another problem, which is there is significantly less standardization for 3D data formats. Um, so just because I have 3D data um, doesn't mean that uh, someone else elsewhere can show it on their platform. Um, and that sucks, right? Um, so there are scans. So um, I'll talk about two of the big ones today, um, but they're much less widely supported and adopted. And what's the point of standards if people aren't using them? Is it a real standard if it doesn't exist in the real world? Um, so <laughs> There are kind of four big categories um, of 3D data formats, and I have made these up basically. Um, and some of these categories lump a whole lot of things into one category. So it's think of these as kind of convenient mental groups rather than anything super strict. Um, but basically, you have your modeling formats. So these are what artists use and like game development assets are in. Um, so GLTF, uh, Collada, OBJ, FBX. Um, 
and they're really good for representing like individual 3D models. But they're all st they're all also still pretty different from one another in like what they represent and how. Um, and then you have CAD formats, um, which are kind of my personal arch nemesis. Not not because not because like I have anything against CAD or CAD data, but the problem is that most CAD software that people use is proprietary, and so the file format's proprietary. And so if someone says, "Hey Emma, I have a Twig," I mean Twig is maybe not a good example. I have a Revit file, right? Um, like I can't do anything with that because it's not an open file format. Um, you know, I can't look up the spec and sort of understand how to read that file. Um, so that's tricky. <laughs> Um, and then we also have point clouds. I'm not going to talk about point clouds much in this presentation um, because the, the kind of the story of the 3D data for point clouds is actually much better um, than for 3D model stuff. The tooling for that is much, much better. Um, so yeah, point clouds are cool, um, but I'm not going to talk about them, sorry. Um, and then in the last category, which is barely a category, is all of the sort of geospatial first 3D data formats. Um, which like I've got gems in there, I've got GeoJSON and you know geo geo databases. Obviously, like some of these things are 2D sometimes and 3D other times, and they're all pretty different. Um, and that can be a challenge because yeah, it's you know if you want to convert from one thing to another, the actual representations that these formats encode can be very different, and that can be very hard. Um, so. <laughs> I may, and I'm not going to go into this because like, I think if this is useful for you, you probably want to sit and look at the diagram properly um, rather than just be pointing at a slide and going, look, a slide. Um, but basically, this is kind of my decision tree um, for you know, what format do I use for data when I'm putting it into Creator. Uh, and the main thing here, um, rather than reading all the labels right now, is like you can't just use one format for everything. <laughs> There is no one format for them all. Uh, sometimes I wish there was. Um, like, it, it very much depends on you know lots of different variables. Uh, so the main things that I consider are what does the visualization platform support. Um, so, like, I have a pretty good idea what Terra supports because I've got build Terra. Uh, but if you were using something like Mapbox, um, you know, Mapbox does have some 3D support. Uh, but it, it, it's much more vector, so Mapbox tends to use vector files and all those sorts of things, whereas CGM uses kind of 3D models and meshes. So you have to think about what the destination of your data is, um, which is pretty basic, but very important. And the second thing is what information does the format encode? So I've touched on this slightly, um, but like one of the problems I have is, so if I have like a, an individual 3D model, um, in a modeling format. Most of the sort of artistic modeling formats that I talked about earlier don't actually attach metadata, like feature information, so like this is a door handle, um, to those meshes. And so if I want to show that in a map, then I have to use a different format for my data. Um, and of course performance, which is so important that it gets its own slide. Um, so we'll get back to that in a sec. Um, but basically, the format that you select can have a huge impact on how it performs, uh, particularly in a web browser where performance is you know, really, really important because you're essentially trying to squeeze as much out of fairly limited hardware as you possibly can. Um, and the fourth thing is open source versus proprietary formats. Um, I always, if I possibly, possibly can, prefer open source formats, not just because I want to support open source and I love open source very much, but because if I want to have, if I want my data to have the longest life possible, then I want people to be able to read it. And if I want people to be able to read it, people have to be able to build their own tools to read my data. Um, so yeah, it comes kind of back to what Alex was saying about being unopinionated, like just because your platform is great. Um, it probably is great, but you know, you need to, you know, in the spirit of open source, portability is so, so, so important. Um, so yeah, that's a really key thing. Uh, so back to performance. <laughs> so um, <coughs> this this is from Obvious Plant. This is a meme. Um, I'm sorry, um, but basically, when it comes to 3D data, if you only remember one performance thing, it's that 
The coecial source data is to the raw vertex data that gets passed to your graphics card together, which basically means it needs to be made up of triangles. Because when your graphics card actually draws things, all it, it only really understands triangles. It makes up all other shapes from triangles. Um, and so if your data isn't triangulated, then uh, you know, when your program runs, uh, it's going to have to triangulate your data, uh, which there are lots of clever algorithms for that, but it's a performance hit, and so if you can avoid it, do that. Um, so this is why GLTF in particular um, is really good because basically it has like the file is made up of a human readable description of like the, the sort of layout of your data, um, and then what gets passed to the graphics card. So um, it's super graphics card friendly and therefore very performant, um, which is why it's often preferred in web applications because it reduces the amount of work that you have to do um, on the client computer. So this is why um, I3S and 3D tiles, which I will talk a bit about later, use this sort of representation internally because we have a need for speed. Um, so yeah, uh, if I go on to 3D tiles now. So 3D tiles is actually an OGC specification um, and it's similar to Esri's I3S, um, but it's not the same, they're not interoperable. So basically, if you have a really, really big data set, so the one on the right um, is part of a data set that's actually the Blue Mountains, but it's a very small part of the data set that covers most of Western Sydney. So it has, like, from a LiDAR scan, all of the buildings in Western Sydney. So it's like, I think it's millions of, of vertices. Um, it's big, it's very big. It's like hundreds of thousands of buildings. Um, and so you have to split it up, right? Because you cannot load something that big in your browser. You only have so much internet bandwidth. The pipe is only so big. So you split it up. So you only load what you need to load because you're probably not looking at in super high detail every single building at once. You know, you zoom in and out. Uh, so you store um, like a big tree with lots of different levels of detail of data. So when you're zoomed out, it had it. You know, you retrieve the data from a low level of detail. It's very similar to like map tiles, basically. There's like a very easy 2D equivalent is um, you know, map tiles when you've got a 2D map is you have like more and detailed map tiles um, related to the size of the area that you're looking at. Uh, so that's it's kind of yeah, a 3D version of map tiles. And what it means is that you can load hundreds of gigabytes of data in a web browser as a user requests them. And you know you couldn't do something like this data set without it because you would just sit there for hours waiting for the entire thing to load. So these are my favorite formats, um, GLTF, um, because um, it's a super simple format that's easy for um, clients to implement, um, like web clients to implement, um, and it's very performant. 3D tiles. Um, because it's uh, sort of very, very well designed. It's a very well designed specification uh, that breaks enormous data into, well, it's not enormous. I always think of it as medium data because it's hundreds of gigabytes rather than petabytes. Um, and then uh, I like IFC for CAD, so I haven't talked about this in a lot of detail. Um, but remember how I was complaining about CAD files um, and how they were mostly proprietary formats? Most CAD programs will export to IFC, um, which is handy because then, you know, the IFC spec is really well defined and so then you can turn that into something that hopefully um, your application can read. Um, so yeah, IFC is good. Um, and my fallback is GeoJSON. Uh, I have managed to, in a pinch, represent fairly complicated 3D buildings as GeoJSON. And I don't recommend it because it's not really what GeoJSON is for. But uh, the plus side of that is that it's very broadly supported um, and you can use stuff like GDAL on it um, and you know you can vaguely, if you open the file rather than it being a binary blob, you can vaguely understand what you're actually looking at. So yes, GeoJSON 3D is definitely a thing. Um, but, 
sometimes you don't get to choose what data people give you. Um, my day often looks like, you know, a customer says, hey Emma, I have this shiny new data set. Please put it on a map. Um, and they give me a data set and it's a format that I've never heard of before. And I have to figure out how to get it into a format that my map supports. And most of the time, unfortunately, there isn't a converter to do that. Um, we, we don't use FME, um, although FME, FME does a lot of support for this stuff. But it's also not open source, and I'm a bit open source obsessed, and I try and use open source tools as much as I possibly can. Um, so yeah, we had to write our own converters, basically. So we wrote one for IPS or 3D tiles, um, so that's Esri, Esri's version of 3D tiles to CC's version of 3D tiles. Um, and then we wrote bin chicken, uh, <laughs> which is a terrible pun um, because bin chicken is a nickname for the ibis, and bin chicken is an information model, and then chicken um, so for IFC to GLTA conversion. Um, so we we use these um, for production at the moment, and we're currently trying to figure out what to do with them. Um, so if you are interested in using these tools, please you know, contact me, tell me how you'd be interested in using it um, so that we can figure stuff out because we don't really know where we're going. Um, having, having complained about the lack of converters, there are a couple. Um, so if you're working with IFC, you can use IFC OpenShell. We couldn't for various reasons, it just didn't suit our use case. Um, but it might be useful for you. Um, there's also Pindel, which is awesome if you're working with point clouds. Um, and then there are actually, there are a couple of tools for converting to GLTF. Um, Collada to GLTF is really, really good. I use that one. Um, Blender's GLTF exporter is fine. Um, it's really good if you have no other options because Blender can import all sorts of things. So if you can then export it, then that's a win. Um, and the Cesium's OBJ to GLTF tool is really cool. Um, and also I should mention Cesium Ion, which is unfortunately not open source, um, but like if you, it's all very well and good saying like, oh, you know, to visualize big data sets, you have to tile it. But um, tiling them is hard. Uh, writing, like writing code to do 3D tiling is not, it's not a trivial problem. Um, and so like we could not have done the New South Wales and Queensland digital twins without using Cesium Ion to tile some of those enormous data sets. Um, so yeah, unfortunately not open source, um, but very, very useful in this space. And just as a quick side note, uh, I'm not going to go into this too much now, um, but if you have a 3D model, so say for example, um, I had a 3D model of the Eiffel Tower and like there's only one Eiffel Tower, right? And like it exists in a very specific place on the earth. But if you have like a 3D model, you don't necessarily know where that lives. Like if you have a model of a cube, usually the information about where that cube exists on the earth isn't in the file. So um, there are ways, particularly for GLTF, to actually embed that information into a file. You can also do it for Collada. Um, so that when you load it in something like Cesium, um, but probably other 3D globes as well, it appears in the right place. Which means that if you're authoring 3D data, it's much easier to send that to someone else and for them to put it in the right place. Um, but the general principle here, no matter what application you're working in, is to keep models in like local Cartesian coordinates, um, east north west or something, um, and then transform to like the coordinates that your platform uses when the application is running rather than doing it beforehand um, because you want to maintain as much precision as possible for as long as possible. And if you work on scales as large as the Earth um, and sort of make the center of the Earth zero, 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 um, you will run into precision problems very quickly. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a project. But yeah, I read a blog post about it. So if you, if you want that tutorial, it exists and I hope it is helpful. And that's it from me. Um, so again, like all of these slides um, and that diagram in more resolution are available online. Um, if that's helpful to you, if you if you think that I said anything wrong, which might be possible, please let me know so I can update the version of the slides that are on there so that I'm not 
eternally wrong because that would be sad. Um, and if you have any questions about Terrier or any of this sort of stuff, I really like it when people email me. Um, so flick me an email, um, even if it's just feedback, that would be super helpful. Um, and Terrier JS also has a discussion forum. Uh, so feel free to drop us a line in there and we can chat.